It is my honor and privilege to welcome, and please join me in welcoming Nancy Seltzman. great to be here and hear all these stories. I certainly have a lot of connections to the stories we heard tonight. And probably the most important thing I need to say is that the books are actually available at Poor Richards. Mm -hmm. So you should all go by there to Poor Richards. Poor Richards. Uh, my story is the story of my life, which started in 1952 in Bloomington, Indiana, in a university town when I was born. And my mother tells me that I came out going like this. I'm happy. And that's pretty much how my whole life has been. I've been a really happy person from the beginning. And I grew up in Bloomington, Indiana with an older sister and two younger brothers. And my parents both worked for Indiana University and it was clear we were all going to go to college no matter what. So I started thinking about where I wanted to go to college when I was in high school. And I had three important criteria. I wanted to go to a school where I could take one class at a time. I wanted to go to a school uh, where I could become a teacher when I graduated. And the third most important thing was I wanted to go somewhere where my hair would be straight because I have naturally curly hair. <laughs> so obviously I chose to come to Colorado College in Colorado Springs. So I moved out to Colorado Springs in 1970 to go to college, and I had a wonderful experience there. I met my first love, who was the captain of the hockey team, and went to college there for four years, student taught at Steel Elementary. Uh, when I graduated, I knew I wanted to stay in Colorado, and Mike was here, so we got married, and I got a teaching job in Widefield School District. And then, of course, uh, how sometimes these things happen. I got divorced two years later. Uh, but a really cool thing is um, Donnie Gody is here. Don Gody's here somewhere. No, he left. Oh, he left. Oh, darn. Well, I met Don Gody, uh, so that would have been in like 1976, and he was doing some work here before, so it was great to see him. I haven't seen him forever. But anyway, so I was teaching, and then I got divorced, and I started a master's program at the University of Colorado and got my master's in special ed, where I met my best friend who's sitting in the front row, Donna Sheldon. And I decided I loved learning and teaching so much that I wanted to go back to school to get a doctorate, like my parents. And so, forgetting that Virginia has very humid weather, <laughs> I applied to the University of Virginia and got in there. And the way things happened, you know, six weeks before I was going to leave to go to the University of Virginia, I met the true love of my life, Joel Herzog. And of course, I met him in Colorado Springs at where Jose Muldoon. <laughs> so he said to me, if you loved me, you would stay in Colorado Springs. <laughs> so he helped me load my U-Haul and drove me to Virginia. <laughs> Where I did go to school for a year, and it was really wonderful, but because I did love Joel, I did move back to Colorado Springs, and I moved in with him over the summer. And at the end of the summer, he said, Nancy, I have claustrophobia, and now you need to move out. <laughs> so Ellen and I have some things in common. <laughs> but luckily, in my case, I moved up to Denver and started working on my PhD at the University of Denver. And Joel, of course, saw the light <laughs> six months later and asked me to marry him. So we got married, and so now this was now in 1981, August of 1981. And he owned a tennis shop. He was a tennis player. He had a tennis shop named Total Tennis, and he'd grown up in Pueblo. And so we got married, and then a year later, we had our first son, Adam. And then two years later, we had another son, Seth. This was now like 1984, and I started working in the schools. I was an assistant director of special ed, and I finished my doctorate in 1985. And we were just going along as a happy family, and then I became the assistant principal at Rising Middle School in Falcon, and an assistant principal at Timberview Middle School in Academy School District. I just loved the jobs that I had. Well, at the very end of the year in 1990, I just made a graduation speech for the eighth graders who were going to be going to the ninth grade, and it was wonderful. And we were out after school, just all having a drink, and I reached under my arm, and I felt this really weird lump. I was 38 years old, but I knew enough to know that that probably wasn't a good thing. 
So I made an appointment went to see the doctor, and the surgeon I saw said, I'm not really sure what it is, but I think it might be an infected sweat gland. So I told Joel, and he said, well, I don't know how you got an infected sweat gland. You never do a thing. <laughs> Because of the infected sweat gland, they did find out that I had the first stages of breast cancer. So I had to figure out what to do when you find out you have breast cancer, they give you a lot of choices. Well, one of the things I did have to do is go to my 20 year high school reunion. <laughs> so that was a, so Joel, Adam, Seth and I went to Bloomington, Indiana for my high school reunion. And while we were gone, someone stole the radio out of my car. When we got back, we discovered this. And so that night, the kids were upstairs brushing their teeth, and they couldn't believe that someone would have broken into my car and stolen my radio. And I thought, well, I need to tell these guys what's going on with me. So I said, well, I know you guys are just amazed about someone stealing my car radio, but I need to tell you that I have these bad cells in my breast, and they're going to take my breast off. And Adam looked at me and he goes, Mom, that is amazing. First they take your car radio. <laughs> not wanting to miss a beat said, but mom, what did they do with all the breasts that they take off? <laughs> and I said, they put them in a room for men to come look at. <laughs> if I had been a little more enlightened, I would have said, and some women. <laughs> but anyway, so they helped me put things in perspective, but of course that night, when I was getting ready to go to bed, and I knew I was going to have surgery the next day, and they were going to remove one breast, and they might remove the other breast. I said to Joel, I'm really worried that you're not going to be attracted to me if I don't have any breasts and they might take off both my breasts. And he looked at me and he said, Nancy, they can take that off and they can take that off, but they better not take that <laughs> off. <laughs> and in case you can't see in the back, yes, he did point between my legs. <laughs> But luckily for me, I had a family that was able to help me keep a sense of humor. They were taking a breast, they were not taking my life. And so I learned from them at that point something really valuable that I was going to need to learn how to put things in perspective. And it's something that I've thought a lot about and it's helped me a lot. So anyway, so that was 1990. Um, I, that, right after I had my mastectomy, I actually changed jobs. I got the principalship at Broadmoor Elementary and it was the greatest job ever. I had my own parking place. That's pretty cool. And it was just, I loved the job. I loved kids, I loved my families, I loved the parents, I loved, I just loved everything about it. And I, it was at Broadmoor for two years, and at the very end of the school year in 1992, I was getting, I got up and I was getting dressed and I looked in the mirror and all I had on the right side of my chest was, it's totally flat and had a scar across it. And I looked in about an inch below my scar, I could see a little bump, and I thought, well, that can't be good, but, you know, maybe it's a pimple or something, I don't know. So, of course, I went to the doctor, and he just numbed my chest, and I could tell by looking at his face that it was not going to be good news. So in 1992, I found out I had a reoccurrence of the cancer. It's a one in a thousand kind of thing that happens. They treated it as a stage four cancer, so then that summer, I started chemo, and I would have chemo on Thursday afternoon and I would throw up on Friday, Saturday, Sunday, go back to work on Monday, because I had chemo for six months. Um, and of course, when you have chemo, there's several breast cancer survivors in here, uh, you lose your hair. So you lose uh, all your hair on your head, you lose your eyebrows, you lose your eyelashes, at least I did, and you lose all of your pubic hair. So you lose your hair all over your body. So one day I was getting out of the shower, and Seth looked at me and he goes, Hey mom, is that what you look like when you were a girl? <laughs> yes, so. So and that was in 1982. So then I had radiation and I had a hysterectomy to help prevent a reoccurrence of breast cancer. And I worked that whole year. Um, I just wore wigs. The kids at school didn't know what I was going through. But the very last week of school, I did finally take my wig off, and my hair was about this long. And I remember getting out of the car. And there were two little kindergartners at the front of the school. They went, 
hello. I said, like, who are you? They said, I'm Dr. Saltzman. They're like, oh, we recognize your voice. That's cool. So anyway, so that was 1992. And meanwhile, Joel had a tennis shop. He was playing a lot of tennis. The boys were playing tennis. And of course, because Joel had a tennis shop, they liked to play hockey. So we did a lot of hockey. Um, but anyway, so we had a pretty amazing life, uh, very happy and wonderful. We had jobs we loved, the kids were happy. And so um, one of the things that Joel liked to do a lot was play tennis and go to tennis tournaments. So we actually went to the US Open. We've been to some Davis Cup tennis tournaments. Well, he had a store downtown right near Port Richards. And a friend of his came in the shop, and this is now September of 1995, and the, his friend said, can you get us tickets to the Davis Cup Tennis Tournament in Las Vegas? Because if you can, I'll rent a small plane and we can fly to Vegas together in a small plane. So he came home, he was really excited that they were going to the Davis. He said, this is going to be a guy's weekend. We'll just go. And I said, okay, September's been, beginning of the school year is pretty busy. And then I realized it was Seth's 11th birthday, it would be Seth's 11th birthday while they were gone. So I said, well, I need to go. So I asked Homer if I can go on the plane. And Joel asked Homer, well, there were only four seats on the plane. So there was the pilot, his wife, Joel, Adam, and Seth was going to be sitting on Joel's lap already. So I just made reservations to fly on a commercial flight. And so they left on September 22nd. And they were actually supposed to go a day earlier, but the weather was really bad, so they didn't take off. They left on Friday, and then I flew after work on Friday to meet them in Las Vegas. And it was a wonderful weekend. You know, we didn't have hockey. We didn't have carding kids all over. We weren't eating fast food. We just spent the, days, the day together. They went to the tennis, and I sat by the pool, and Seth sort of got bored and hung out with me. And then we went to Cirque du Soleil, and for Seth's birthday, it was just wonderful. We had a great weekend. So, um, before, I forgot a story, before we left, and this was important, I'm sorry, before we left, we before we left, I picked the kids up at school. You know, we had a lot of fun, but we were always busy, but we'd gone to our favorite hamburger place called Classic Hamburgers. It doesn't exist anymore, but it was on Nevada. And I did lunch duty every day, but I always forgot to eat lunch. So I picked up Adam at the junior high, and he said, I'm really hungry, let's get something to eat. So we went to Classic Hamburgers, and we got there, and I was so hungry. We all had hamburgers, and we're sitting in the car, and I'm eating this hamburger, and I was going, mm. <laughs> mm. <laughs> And all of a sudden, this voice from the back, Adam, Mom, that sounds like you and Dad in the ho in, in on Sunday mornings in the bedroom. <laughs> and people who knew Joel, he used to talk about sex all the time. But, <laughs> but anyway, so that happened right before we got to Las Vegas. Well, when, the Saturday night we were in the in Las Vegas in the hotel room. One of Joel's favorite things to do was to make love in a hotel room with the kids in the room. <laughs> well, of course. That Saturday night, Joel rose to the occasion. <laughs> so anyway, so the next morning we get up and we're walking down the street and we had just had brunch and I have Adam on one side and I have Seth on the other side and we're just walking along and all of a sudden Adam looks up at me and he goes, Mom, I think you and Dad had classics in the hotel room last night. <laughs> almost 13, he wasn't that cool. <laughs> anyway, so um, I had to fly back on the commercial flight that day, and so they were gonna watch the tennis, so I said I love you to both boys, and they grabbed Joel's hands, and they walked in the crosswalk, and I looked at Joel, and he looked at me, and he said, I love you, be careful. And I looked at him, and I said, I love you, you be careful. And it wasn't foreshadowing, it was just the kind of thing that two people who'd had a wonderful weekend together said to each other. But then I got on, my, on the airplane and I flew home, but I flew into really bad weather on the commercial jet, and I thought there's no way they're coming home because the weather's just too bad. But when I got home, there was a message on the recorder, and it was Joel, it was 3.30 in the afternoon, this was all before cell phones, and he said, we're taking off, I'll be home about 7, 7.15 tonight, see you tonight. So I went to work, was working on the school newsletter, and I started checking messages at home about 7.15. Checked a message at home at 8.15. There were no messages. Checked again about quarter of nine. Checked again about 9.15, and then I couldn't stand it, so I thought, well, they probably got home and they forgot to call me. 
So I just drove home, got home, nobody was home. So I just sort of started to busy myself. And about 10 o'clock at night, the phone rang, and the person identified himself. He said, I'm uh, Sergeant Thompson, I'm calling from, Sergeant McDonald, I'm calling from emergency services in Denver. And I said, but can you tell me anything? And he said, well, I just want to let you know that we have two airplanes down and we can't find your husband's plane. So we're just trying to find out what's happened. And I said, can you tell me, do you know something? And he said, no, we really don't know anything. What happens is the weather's so bad, they find planes using the satellite coordinates and they had one and they needed the other one that they would get after midnight. And then he said, are you religious? And I said, no, why? He said, I don't want you sitting by yourself. So thank goodness I have my best friend, Donna Sheldon, and I called her and she came over and we talked about everything like, oh, if they did, if there was a plane crash, we're sure they're fine, but we'll just drive to get them and we'll be able to deal with it. We never talked about if we thought they had died in a plane crash. But about 12, 15, the phone rang, Donna answered it, and she handed it to me, and I said hello, and the voice said, I'm sorry to tell you, there were no survivors. So I said to him, those were the most beautiful boys. And he said, I'm sure they were, I am so sorry. And I collapsed on the floor, and Donna held me, and then I thought, I have to let people at school know. I have to call my boss and let him know what's happening. I have to call my parents and tell them, and I have to call Joel's parents and tell them. So I got up and I started making phone calls. And I called my family and my siblings called me back and Joel's siblings called me back. And then by then it was probably about 2 or 2.30. And I decided that if I went to sleep, I would wake up the next morning and find out that it was a really bad dream. So Donna crawled into bed with me, and we lay there, and she said, you know, every person you love is getting on an airplane to come see you right now. Which was a wonderful thought, actually, <coughs> that everybody was coming to be with me. And so I fell asleep. Donna says she lay there like this. <laughs> And I woke up about 5.30, and actually I had two good friends come over, and one of them was a psychologist. And the first thing he says I said to him was, you know, Larry, my whole family just died in an airplane crash. Am, am I in shock? And he said, yes, you are. And then I called my boy's best friend's parents to let them know what had happened. But meanwhile, the whole school was mobilizing so that they could tell people as they arrived what had happened, and we were at my house planning a memorial service that we did hold, that this happened Sunday night, and we had a memorial service at the Antlers on Wednesday night, and we were just talking about it, and we had well, over 2,500 people come to the memorial service. All of the kids from my school, the hockey teams, the tennis, uh, men wore shorts, because Joel wore shorts all the time, and we had this beautiful service. And then, uh, my family stayed till that Friday, <coughs> they left, and then I went back to work the following Monday. So I took a week off, but I'd known my, my teachers were there every single day. No teacher took any time. When I came back to work, I walked in my office, and on my desk was a little sticky note that a first grader had left for me. And it said, in comes love, out goes sadness. And it reinforced for me how important it was for me to be at school modeling for kids that when something horrible happens to you, that you have to keep going on, that you make a choice to keep going, and that you just have to do it. And I felt compelled to be at work to model for them what you do. It's okay to cry, it's okay to be sad, and absolutely it is okay to talk about it. And the kids actually had tons of questions. They wanted to ask me, did Adam and Seth know they were going to die? What happened? And I answered those questions to the best of my ability. I believe they died on impact. They did, the plane did hit a tree and skid. We don't, I don't really know what happened, but I'm going to believe that they didn't know what was gonna to happen to them. 
So I was at school and the kids kept coming in to talk to me and tell me things like, I know how you feel because my grandma died. Or I know how you feel because I have a rat that died. <laughs> <laughs> and I had so much support from the Colorado Springs community. I got letters, le I got over 2,000 letters, one of them from Richard Squirman, who offered to help me if I needed to sell a tennis shop, which I really appreciate. And I just had so much support, and then of course I was at school. One day I got home, I had some recording at home, and it was this. Hello, this is Mabel. I'm calling you from the Widows Association. <laughs> <laughs> we meet on the third Thursday of every month at the polka club. <laughs> we don't do the polka. We just meet there. <laughs> We'd like you to join us. Nancy, I need to tell you, I have been a widow for 10 years and it never gets any better. <laughs> <laughs> and actually it does get better. The intensity of the pain and the loss for me decreased over a long period of time. I will never get over losing my family. I will always think about my family and love them very much. But I have been very lucky in my life because I was in love with Joel Herzog and eight years after he passed away, I met another man who a friend of mine set me up with and he would normally be here but he's traveling for work. And I fell in love with him and we've been together nine years and it's been wonderful being with him. And one really amazing thing about him is that I told him that I wanted to write a book about Joel, Adam, and Seth, and what I'd gone through. Because people ask me, how did you survive this? And I would say, my dogs made me get up every day. <laughs> Donna called me every day. My brother Rob called me every day. I got letters, I mean, I can go on and on and on with why I was able to survive, and I thought it was important to write about. Greg read every draft of that book and told me that he loved learning about my family and encouraged me to write the book. Just to let you know what a wonderful guy is. So I feel incredibly lucky that I've had that much love in my life. So I remember all the time to put things in perspective because I know people who've had horrible things happen to them and I just want to have the horrible things that happened to me and not horrible things that happened to everybody else and just figure out how to deal with those things. And I know that if you let love come in, your sadness can go out. So thank you very much.